friends, and welcome to our first destination on this journey into the design of Hitman. Each level in Hitman plays out like a James Bond movie set during Groundhog Day, a complex simulation that repeats each and every time you load the level, where Agent 47 has the ability to remove a character from the play and the actors are forced to keep the show going without them. When the creators of Hitman, IO Interactive, started to create what they hoped would be the ultimate game in the series, forming this accurate simulation was the key, and today those developers are going to tell us how they did it. The first level IO Interactive created took them years to refine. Paris was the test case for an entire game. It would help them construct the rules of the world and the technology required to hold it all together. Everything from the level design to target behaviors, the number of NPCs, the missions, outfits, opportunities, and even the tone of the game started in Paris. It had fundamental things like uh, obviously crowd systems, uh, but social stealth, clear outfits, clear roles, clear uh, sort of layers of the onion, if you will. Uh, it had uh, concepts like uh, that are obviously uh, part of the Hitman legacy, but you know, you start in a place that is fully simulated where you are allowed to go around and just observe. You're not sort of pressured to do anything specific. It tested out the idea of you know, presenting the target, so Viktor Novikov walks down the staircase immediately. You know, how do we present targets? What is a, a sort of, a, a, the, sort of the, the front target? Maybe there's a, a sort of a, a deeper target like Dahlia. All of that stuff was proven. The fashion show itself is a fully simulated uh, event where you know, the uh, fashion models are out in the back. They will actually get called on the stage, but with the knowledge that any of them could disappear at any given point. So the scripting here was some of the most advanced we had done uh, at that point. It was trying to actually try to figure out every hard problem we had in the game, so that if we solved it, uh, we would be ready to build the other, uh, the other levels. A little bit of a sidetrack, but many people, like when they, they especially on PC, when they go, hey, I have this super potent uh, graphics card. I don't know, I don't get why Hitman is not running, you know, more frames per second. Well, it's because the, uh, one of the biggest uh, sort of costs is, is running all these AIs, and that's the CPU. So uh, it's a little bit of a different beast. And that was something we uh, spent a lot of time discussing, trying to figure out how do we even do it. Uh, we ended up with around 300 NPCs, uh, which is what, uh, what Paris was made up of. And it was also tonally a big change, right? It was high class, uh, one of the most luxurious venues, a, a huge fashion event. It was trying to send some signals about elevating the, um, I think in a, in a sense, elevating Agent 47. Like, what sort of targets would you hire him to, to take out? He doesn't just take out anybody. He's like the guy you call for the most impossible hits in the, under the most impossible uh, circumstances. That was really important to us to say that that's not, he's beyond it. We're sort of working with a little bit more of a mythical uh, character, if you will. And then that means we had to think up some of these situations that were, you know, larger than life. And, uh, and Paris was our a vertical slice benchmark level. Uh, it also had the crowd system. It had a lot of stuff it needed to showcase and prove to us how we, how do we even do this? Hitman is a puzzle game. Uh, I'm not sure everyone is aware of that. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't look like it when you look at the box, like it, but it is a puzzle game. Like it can turn into an action game and it can be a stealth game and it can be social stealth, which is our, you know, our thing. But I, th I think it's important to, to look at it as a puzzle game, especially when designing it. We deal with it like a few different things. Like I think the most important one is what we call Swiss cheese. Just to make sure that we don't have dead ends, make sure that the player can move around and will always have another option because, you know, stuff will happen eventually and, uh, and the player will often have to improvise. So you need to see your options in your environment. Then we work with um, public and private spaces. Public spaces will like represent the initial agency of the player. So this is where you can just like walk around and, and try to get a feel of the level. Um, and we find that these are really, really important. Allow them to get inspired and start seeing the opportunities. And then we looked a little bit into how you could define the different 
private and public spaces. So you have some public spaces that are very free and very uh, open. And then you have uh, spaces that like shops and the church and a beach and uh, all these little kind of microbiomes that will tell the player how to act. Like we will expect a, a specific type of behavior from you in this space. And you will often have someone owning that space. Like you'll have the priest owning the church, you'll have the ice cream guy <laughs> owning the ice cream shop and the butcher, uh, of course. You will always have a trespass area in these spaces. Um, and you probably haven't been there before in real life. Uh, and you understand how it works. You, you understand that it is the butcher who's gonna get mad at you if you walk behind the counter and you have to become the butcher to do it. So it's like it's a nice way for us to communicate trespass rules and disguise rules. Romers and dwellers are like very broad uh, archetypes of our targets. Um, so if you look at Paris, for instance, you have uh, Dahlia Margolis, uh, who is a dweller. Like she's in her little lair <laughs> or, or uh, her auction uh, happening in the in the top the level. And then you have Novikov, who's like roaming around. He's like the public. He's like boasting and talking and chatting and drinking. And the reason why we would have these two different types of targets is because it will invite the player to approach them in different ways. Like it's two different play styles. If you have a dweller, you tell them to infiltrate. And if you have a roamer, you're telling them to sort of follow them around and see what they're doing. Like, and, uh, oh, okay, so he's gonna end up back here and have a drink. The, uh, the level design team typically on a level have such an, a massive amount of scripting to do, uh, which is completely non-linear, and they have to, at all points, create their acts, their scripts, their behaviors in ways where if something is missing, the game doesn't break. Most level designers that join I.O. have to unlearn a lot of stuff they've been used to, trigger boxing stuff, to a high degree, for instance, uh, saying, okay, this happens, then this happens. You can't do that in Hitman. So the ability to overview the spaghetti you know, of our graph view and figure out where the hell are we in what loop and how do we jump from one sort of rail to another rail for the target, for instance, is a lot of, uh, well, that's basically years of work for the, for the design team on a level. So there's a funny thing going on. We built Paris and up until its alpha state, so now the entire palace is there, most of the loops are there, everything is basically in place. We got a lot of user research. And what became apparent is that uh, Hitman fans that had played Blood Money and before were excited about a lot of stuff in Paris. But if you weren't a hardcore Hitman fan, there were a few things that really, uh, that really uh, made you struggle, which is kind of, uh, it made us in, uh, go some interesting routes. So one of them was that most people got gunned down all over the place in Paris because they didn't really expect the game to punish you that hard. So that actually made us uh, realize that we needed a way of uh, telling players off without necessarily shooting them. And it also felt a little odd, you know, like I'm a guest at a fashion show, I'm probably important since I got a VIP ticket and all that stuff. I go into a sort of the wrong restroom and now you're shooting me dead. Uh, that felt a little excessive. Uh, so the whole ex escort behavior actually uh, happened because of Paris. Uh, and actually because we actually figured out that it, you know, truly conveying who can go where, what do, why, why does every outfit fit, um, was sort of impossible. But the solution was to say, well, unless you display really aggressive behavior by either punching people or you know, having a visible uh, firearm, most of the time you're just going to be asked to follow the guy who will then escort you out. And what do you know, you also maybe, you are, you know, since the guy is there, he's allowed. In many cases, obviously his outfit is valuable. So by just following him, sometimes he takes a route that you know, isolates him and then there's your disguise. IO Interactive had created a simulation that not only held together as the player pushed and pulled on it, but one that always presented new options to the player if they were stuck, lost, or being escorted. But during user research, they ran into another problem. Despite the complexity of these levels, many test players said that the locations felt barren, boring. While there were hundreds of non-player characters filling each room, it didn't seem like there was much actually going on. This resulted in the team adding several new layers of narrative logic to give 47 things to do, and these came in a number of different forms. 
Mission stories allowed the player to enter the level on a guided path with a set of objectives, all tied around an interesting narrative hook. And then there are opportunities dotted around the map that allow players to take on new ways to get to the target. All these put the player on what the developers call a rail, a path to the target that they can track and then influence how the simulation plays out. But each additional rail added to the complex web of logic running this simulation. Now they needed ways to pull the targets out of their core loops. And of course ways for the player to jump from one rail to another. Say if they came across a new opportunity while in the middle of pursuing one. That, that feedback back then was to me like, oh, that was rough because you know we had tons of characters and tons of things going on and all these things uh, with Nabikov's loop. But what we actually didn't have was a lot of uh, narrative moments. So in that way, I also think we laid the foundation for how we tell story in Hitman in the level by having all these uh, different uh, subplots going on, you know, Victor meets his old KGB contact in the Pagoda, Dali has all sorts of things going on in the auction. We didn't do a lot of that stuff before Alpha, and then uh, we actually started putting that in to bring life to the whole thing. And that also led us to what eventually became mission stories and the idea that some of these will actually also allow, if you follow them and you play out your part in them, to get close to your targets in certain ways. Typically, if you have a long target loop, then we need ways of interrupting it if you do certain things. Otherwise, you're going to wait 24 minutes for you know, a target to arrive and then just disappear again. So I think what we typically try to signal is what kind of meaningful chance do you have of affecting a target? Um, for instance, if you tamper with the virus in Sapienza, well, then Silvio will come down to the laboratory, just as a very simple example of that. Otherwise, he's happy to live his life in this uh, loop in, inside the mansion. So the classic is overhearing a conversation. Two people saying, oh, can't believe they're using this super flimsy, uh, <laughs> I don't know, scaffolding for this thing. If someone <laughs> would uh, have a wrench or something, that would probably kill someone. And then uh, Diana goes, mm hmm, that sounds super interesting. Maybe you should uh, try that out. Um, and then it's sort of this little step-by-step -step, uh, guidance, like getting a disguise, finding the right item, um, finding people, maybe talking to them. Um, and then we let go before the kill. That was like a design principle. We didn't want to tell you how to do it. We wanted to give you like a nice setup and maybe have a super obvious way of doing it. But how you do it, uh, we don't want to dictate. We didn't want to go like fail if you killed someone the wrong way. I mean, my personal favorite, I think will always be uh, the Helmet Kruger opportunity. Uh, Sean Maxim, who worked on uh, Life is Strange, he was our director at the time and him and Christian was, they were like uh, trying to find the balance of how opportunity should work. So it was together with him and it was Eskil and my old uh, lead, uh, Lee was there as well. And we we're just sitting in this room trying to like come up with a cool experience. And I think it was Sean Maxim who's just like, I want our players to just try and be a model. like. Let's give them that experience. Also, at that point in time, like uh, being having this more feminine role, right? Was that maybe wouldn't would they like that? Wouldn't it? they? And, and we were like, to hell with it! Of course they would. It's gonna be awesome. They're gonna love it. We're gonna at least give them the chance to try and, and just be in the spotlight and, and be on a catwalk, because that's for sure something that our players <laughs> probably haven't tried. That <laughs> that's like a very very different experience, right? From from yeah, I, what we normally do in the games. The opening levels of Hitman 2016 are perfect examples of the two main level types the team at I.O. had developed. So if you enjoyed Swiss cheese, here are two more terms to add to your level design lexicon. Fortresses and snail houses. Paris was a typical fortress, a distinct area the player must break into, while Sapienza was a snail house, a more circular design where the objectives lie in the center, the player encouraged to explore around it via the surrounding public spaces to discover various ways in. But as the team became more experienced, they began to explore different ways of designing these levels. Things like tying the outfit system directly to doors in Hokkaido, creating an inverted fortress in the Mumbai slums, and one of the more controversial levels, one with no public spaces, in Colorado. 
In the next few videos, we're going to sit down with more of the design team to talk about how they created these levels, the opportunities and set pieces within them, and even the design of the game's latest offering, the bank. What do you think the most complex level that you guys have made in both those games is? In terms of layout, it's probably Mumbai. In terms of uh, set piece design, it's without a doubt, it's Miami. In terms of uh, events and scripting, I th I'd say it's Paris. Really? Yeah. The first one? Yeah. If you, go, you compare that to the, 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 the levels we have uh, in season two, like they're way more structured and uh, you look going to Paris like Whoa, and you can tell it's been uh, worked on by so many different people and just trying to figure out what's the standards, how, we do, how do we do things, uh, it's crazy. Yeah, we have procedures to like uh, make it easier, but like if I had to go in uh, and change something in Novikov's or Dahlia's loop, core loop, I would be very afraid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> Thank you.